Welcome to this week's episode of Being Human. Today, I'm delighted to say my guest is Jerome de Flander. He's joining us uh, from Belgium. He's an author, a speaker, and the chairman of the Institute for Strategy Execution. Jerome, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. It's, uh, it's a pleasure. And today, I thought we'd dive into this book, uh, the, a recent book of yours called The Art of Performance. And, and the reason that we made connection, because I, I found something online where you shared the story of this educational psychologist in Budapest who uh, uh, created this grand experiment uh, uh, for his daughters. Um, and it was an extraordinary story. So I wondered if we ought to kind of start from there, if, if you're okay, and, and then work out from that. You know, t tell us about this, uh, this chess story. Yeah, sure. Well, the, the goal of the art of performance was to identify how to grow exceptional performance. And, and one of the most fascinating stories that I came across was from Leslo Polger. He's a um, psychologist, a professor, and he was a little bit uh, fed up with the educational system at the time uh, because it was focused very much on, on talents and not so much for accessible for everyone. So he, uh, he went uh, into several verbal discussions with uh, several people saying that uh, it, it, it should change, but nobody was really listening. And uh, so he came up with uh, pretty much one of the boldest experiments ever done, where he, uh, he wrote a paper and he said, well, um, my child will be uh, the best chess player in the world. And that was, at the time, he, he wasn't even married. So uh, he, uh, he wrote that um, in, as a scientific paper. And uh, so the next step was, uh, yeah, he, uh, it was before the, the internet time. So he, uh, he, he went uh, to put some announces, announcements in a newspaper. In the end, he found a wife and uh, he ended up having uh, three children, three girls. And uh, he started teaching them uh, to play chess. And uh, the interesting thing is that uh, once his children were at the age of four and five and they started to begin winning tournaments, everybody was saying, well, your, your children are gifted. They're, they're talented to play chess. And uh, he always referred to his paper to say, no, look, I've, uh, I've identified uh, what I wanted to do. And uh, there are other drivers that... Uh, push performance forward, uh, it's not so much related to, uh, to talent. And uh, well, his children did fantastic. Um, they all reached uh, the top of the field and especially his youngest daughter. Uh, she was the, the number one uh, female chess player in the world for 26 years in a row. Wow. Uh, beating also many male um, famous chess players and uh, so he, uh, he was basically one of the first uh, professors in the world that uh, moved away from yeah, what in our field is known as the talent theory. And so what separates the, the good from the great, uh, we have been educated that it's talent, but he was one of the first to indicate, no, it's, it's, it's not talent. Talent does play a role, and so your genetics do, do play a role, but the effect is, is maybe, well, if I would put a number on it, I would say maybe 5%. Uh, really? Yeah. That low? Because, yeah. I, mean, I mean, it's an extraordinary story, right? That you declare before your kids are born, they're going to be chess masters. And then yeah. just through, well, you, I'm sure you'll elaborate, uh, you know, through, through, uh, through pr practice and particular styles of practice, you, you could achieve, achieve greatness. And it, and it blew my mind because my understanding had been, well, the best predictor of, uh, performance is IQ and IQ um, has a very high genetic component like 80% uh, is based on our genes uh, and so, so 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 this has really affected my mental model because I thought okay well I'm I'm above I'm above average IQ but I'm not you know I'm not Elon Musk genius so you know I can expect to do well in life but I'm, I'm likely to ever to reach you know the, the the levels that some of these people who we consider geniuses with with super high IQs, and and this was a real like shock to us. Is that system like okay, Richard? Maybe that's not quite true. You know, maybe that you've got a self limiting belief here, um, 
and what you're telling me that is that yes, G's play a role, and yes, um, IQ might play a role, but it's much, much smaller than I had considered. So it's uh, yeah. yeah, it's true, and it also took me some time to really believe it. And uh, but once you start diving into what science has to tell us, you'll find many obscure experiments that. Uh, that reconfirm this this view and the the, the great thing is that um, in the world of sports uh, it already took hold and uh, many of the concepts to to grow performance have been adopted there but um, to my surprise in the business world uh, it, it still hasn't um, and even if you look at the musical world for example one of the stories i also found was um, well, if you look at music, who is one of the most famous musicians of all times? People will always end up with, with Mozart in their top three. And uh, if, you, if you take a biography written about Mozart about 30 or 40 years ago, the, the, the underlying message would be Mozart became successful because he was gifted. Um, and his, his particular talent is, is what people would call absolute pitch. And that is basically that you recognize every sound and turn it into the exact notes uh, immediately. And you can even reproduce it. So basically, if you have a glass in front of you and you, you, you hit it with a knife, uh, somebody with absolute pitch can immediately say that's a, that's a G or an E or they, they know immediately what note it, it would be. Um, and you share in the book about Mozart being able to do this with the clock, right? And nine-year-old Mozart, exactly. the, the clock would tick. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, that's that's. Yeah, that. I found a, a newspaper clipping from the 1700s where uh, somebody describes that um, that they found a kid who was able to uh, to reproduce notes, and it, it became sort of like a, a rarity circus where, uh, yeah, they would invite people, and uh, and he would uh, he would do that. Um, it's, it's extremely rare, and uh, one of the only other musicians that I found that also had it was uh, Frank Sinatra, for example, uh, who also had it. Um, so everybody believed, uh, it was written even in, in famous biographies about Mozart, that this was the reason why he became successful. But uh, there was one researcher in Japan who said, well, I don't believe that. Um, he was like Polgar. Uh, also, he, he had a different ID. So he basically went to the local um, music school and he convinced, I think, the parents of 26 toddlers to say, hey, do you want to participate in a, in, a, in a crazy experiment? I want to teach your children the same uh, uh, special gift Mozart had. And, uh, well, in the end, he found a bunch of parents that said, well, yeah, sure, I want to do it. And um, he, uh, he put a piano in, in their home. And uh, he, he developed a specific technique uh, to teach uh, your hearing. And uh, he, he gave them assignments for the parents. And I had to practice about 10 to 15 minutes every day for, for one year and a half uh, on, on a specific technique. And uh, to, uh, to the surprise of, of many people, all children in the experiment developed absolute pitch. Yeah, so, I mean, that's extraordinary. 22. Yeah. So two dropped out for personal reasons, right? But yes, then 22 exactly. who stayed yes. with it, all of them developed all perfect pitch. All of them developed perfect pitch. So that's another amazing story, a scientific story. So it's not some, something somebody invented, but uh, he, he, he really he wrote a paper about it afterwards. So you can look it up online where he, he described how he did it. And uh, it, now, it now is in the music world accepted that absolute pitch is something that can be taught and there are many people that uh, now make a big jump forward in their musical career because they now have a method to learn how to develop their hearing in order to become uh, better musicians right um, so in the musical world in the in 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 in, in the world of sports in, in all those areas people have shown that talent is a much smaller driver for performance than, than we imagine. Now, the only thing we have to do is convince the business world uh, that, uh, that this is the case, because still there, um, I was in another, I was in a company yesterday uh, delivering a keynote and uh, yeah, they still have a program called talent management where some people 
are expected to have it and, and other people don't. Um, so it's, it's, it's a pretty stubborn myth that, that you would find in, in, in the average uh, organization. Right. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, as, even as I say that, yeah, a lot of companies will still have this system where they um, identify like high potential individuals, right? If they're the ones we're going to mark out for extra training and development. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's fascinating. Um, and, but, but the other thing you say, which, which seems so, sort of starkly obvious when I read it in the book, and I was like, of course that's true, because a lot of people know this sort of 10,000 hours thing, right, the, from the Malcolm Gladwell, I think, the, the Outliers book, right, that if we, if we just put in the 10,000 hours, you know, we'll become masters in whichever field we, we choose. So he was making a so, so somewhat similar point. But then you make the point, we all, we all, most of us will clock up 10,000 hours worth of driving, but we all don't become Formula One champions. So it's yeah. not just about the hours. So what, what can you tell us about the, the nature of the, in, in which we practice? Well, if you look at practice, and I think um, I, I, I love the writing of Malcolm Gladwell, and he, uh, he made a big effort to make us conscious about the other drivers of performance. But um, he now also admits that when you challenge him on the 10,000 hours, that it's not 100% correct. So. If you, if you look at uh, the mastery curve, basically everybody runs through the same stages. And the first stage is a, is a novice, you train, and uh, you can then drop out if, you, if, you, if you're not interested anymore. But gradually when you continue, you start to put in more hours to practice, but uh, basically if, if everybody would practice in the same way, um, in a professional way, people will all end up to become Formula One drivers or become a, a three-star chef. Um, the difficulty is that it, it's not about practice, but it's, it's about a special kind of practice, um, which is called, which I call deep practice. Um, the easiest way to imagine that is to think about a donut. If you have a donut, there is a hole in the middle, that's basically you're, you're not practicing at all, then you get bored and, and nothing is happening. If, if you're practicing um, on, the, on the dough, and in the middle part of the donut, basically that's what people would call flow. And you're not stretching yourself, but you're using your current capabilities to the extent of something that you have mastered. And so for example, I'm not a great cook, but I can cook. So I would make dishes that I've made before, uh, they don't challenge me, but I enjoy the process and I keep my skills at the level where they are. If you look at a body, for example, and you want to keep your muscle structure uh, similar to what you have today, you have to practice at 40% of your maximum capacity. And if you do that, you won't lose any muscles. So that's basically in the donut part and with skills, it's the same. Once you go outside of the donut on the outer side, you're in the area which is called deep practice. And what you will notice is that it's very tiring. So it's energy consuming. And it's not something you can keep up for a very long time. Um, my daughter now is uh, studying at university. And uh, if she's in deep practice, so she's learning something new and she's using that technique, she's always saying, well, dad, this is really tiring. After one hour, I'm, I'm, I'm that tired. You find the same with musicians. With if you're if you're really stretching yourself, you you get tired. Once you go way beyond the donuts, you come in an area where it, it it doesn't really have any value at all because it's so tiring and you get uh, annoyed very quickly. So that's not the area. So one of the crucial things you have to do if you want to become better is to understand the concept of the donuts and to figure out a training program that works for you, which is partly on the donut itself, because that's the part where you get pleasure from your training. And partly just outside the donut, where you don't like it, but you're actually growing as an individual in the field that you have chosen. So it's that combination that really pushes people forward. And um, so that's a crucial concept that I describe in the book that, um, that people can master. And you can master it 
in pretty much every every field. Uh, when you say pretty much every field, are there any fields you've identified where, because to my mind it comes maybe super advanced maths or, or there, there are particular fields where it, genetics plays a much higher role and actually this doesn't apply. Have you discovered it? Well, uh, I dived into it because I was curious to see what, what would happen. But uh, yeah, pretty much I'm saying because I'm not 100% convinced. I, I didn't study all the areas. But uh, if you look at math, for example, um, there is a, a Scandinavian professor um, who, uh, who wanted to answer that particular question. And he, his question was, can you uh, become smarter than you are to, by remembering uh, numbers. And if you look at the short-term memory, the average person can remember between four and seven numbers, and that's basically it. Um, and uh, he, he found an obscure research paper from 1929 where somebody um, apparently found a technique that you could push it. So he, he spent a lot of energy into, can I develop a training method that basically nobody knows? So basically, he, he understood the concept of the donut, um, but nobody, he, he didn't find any technique on deep practice on memory training. So he developed one um, on his own, and that technique now is known as chunking, which is basically um, challenging your brain um, to combine information that you already have available. And um, the interesting thing is, um, he actually uh, did it with an individual. He took one of the students on campus in, in his business school, and he started practicing with that individual using the techniques they developed together. And uh, it's amazing. The guy broke the world record, and he could remember more than yeah, 80 or 90 numbers in a row. And uh, yeah, he, he even became... His name is Steve Loon, and uh, yeah, he, he was uh, on, on episodes, on, on famous news shows, and uh, yeah, with one of the most remarkable memories uh, because he could, he could remember it. And that technique, chunking, um, has been copied now to several other fields where people that have to remember um, a lot of information use chunks. So it's basically combining information into larger building blocks, and then that building block becomes one. So you're not expanding your short-term memory, but you're basically combining information in a smart way so that uh, you can store more information. Um, it's one of the core techniques that is used with chess players, um, where if you want to advance uh, quickly in chess, chunking is one of the the major uh, training techniques that uh, that will help you to do so, but um, you can pretty much apply it in uh, in any other field uh, in any other field as well. Right, <clears throat> but strictly speaking, that's memory, not not maths per se, right? Yeah. So, are there are there particularly sort of complex cognitive tasks where this this falls down that you've discussed? Well, I think, like we said, in the, in, in, uh, there are genetics. And yeah. uh, somebody with an IQ of 200 will grasp things much quicker than somebody with an IQ of 100. I think it doesn't mean that it becomes impossible for somebody with a lower IQ. The problem is that the resistance to learning becomes so difficult that at a certain point in time, the person with an IQ of 200 just um, will be able to do much more deep practice than somebody with an IQ of, uh, of 120, for example. So I don't believe it's mere genetics, uh, but it's, it's about the training effort people can, people can absorb. And the same is mm -hmm. true if you, if you take um, steroids, it doesn't directly impact your performance, but it impacts your muscle structure so that the training ability that you have becomes different. If you look at the Tour de France and people take EPO, um, basically you don't um, cycle faster, but the advantage is that at the end of the evening, uh, 
um, you will restore your energy much faster than somebody who doesn't take it. So the next day you're back at 100% and somebody else will only be at 90%. Right, and EPO's with the, the blood trans. What's EPO? <laughs> <laughs> well, EPO, I, I'm, not, I'm not an expert either, but it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a drug people take to, uh, to, to enhance their, um, their abilities to, uh, to recover faster in, um, in cycling. Okay, so, so it, it, yeah, so as I said, so IQ may be a facilitator of a deep practice, but it really is the deep practice that makes the difference, not, not necessarily the IQ, right? Exactly. Uh, um, and I guess even from my own experience, I can think of super smart people who aren't necessarily fulfilling on the potential potentially you might expect. And you know, that would be an explainer for why we see that phenomenon, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, so so I'm actually interested in, in, in you now. So what what do you do? Where where's your kind of edge with this now? What where are the, the areas in which you're engaging in deep practices, deep practice, and what's been your journey in, in developing that ability? Well, I try to apply it in 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 all the fields that I'm uh, that I'm active in. Um, let's say, for example, writing. Um, I, I I now finished my head of yard of performance is my third book, and uh, well, basically, writing is also a journey of uh, improving yourself. And uh, basically, if you look at writing, you can also break it down into chunks that you have to master. Um, when I finished my second book, for example, um, I was happy because it was an improvement compared to my first one. Um, but I still was um, interested to see, okay, what is now the difference between the quality of my book uh, and, let's say, the, the top 10 bestsellers in the world? So I started studying those books to see, okay, can I identify chunks of, 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 of writing that they apply and uh, that, that, that I don't master yet or that I haven't identified. One of the interesting things that I came across was that um, I'm, I'm a very practical person. So I like to summarize things for my readers. So in my first book, I summarized um, the content at the end of each chapter. And I got positive feedback. But if I then studied books of other writers, of the, of the really the top ones, they didn't summarize, but what they ended each chapter on an emotion, either a very positive or a very negative emotion. So I studied that and uh, it was remarkable. Uh, the difference between good books and great books was the, the emotional uh, layer uh, that was injected using stories. So one of the chunks that I identified was storytelling. I wasn't particularly good. I wasn't focused on it. So I spent maybe a year um, identifying, okay, what is a story? How do, you, how do you identify a story? How do you integrate emotion into a story? What's an emotion? How do you transfer emotion? How do you put it on paper? Um, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, I started out as a novice, um, and, and if you look at Malcolm Gladwell, what makes him such a great author is that he's a master in capturing emotion, matching it with a story, and, and transferring that. Um, basically, if, if you honestly look at the, the number of ideas in his book that came from him, they're very limited. But the way how he is able to package it into stories and bring a message across. I haven't met any other author that, that, that can do it as, as his level. So he, he's really at the top. I'm, I'm far from that level, but I can say now that I've mastered the technique of, of storytelling and uh, I get different feedback. On my first book, people said, it's interesting. Now people would say, yeah, you touched me, you've inspired me. So the, the, the feedback, I've put much more emotion into my books, also my own emotion. Um, and the feedback that you get is also much more emotional. So it's like a, a different dialogue that you, that you have with your readers using that particular element. Um, and that, that was inspired by, by, by deep practice. Um, 
so, so that's where, where I have applied it. Um, I also applied it in a different dynamic. Um, I've, I've been a musician uh, on, on amateur level. Um, and after some time, I, I felt I wasn't progressing anymore like I wanted to. And I, I tried to go outside of my donuts to see if I could push myself. But I very quickly figured that if I wanted to really go to an expert level, I, I play the guitar, uh, it, it would require much more energy and effort. And uh, if I was honest with myself, the time and the energy I got back from playing the guitar wasn't as high as uh, I got from writing. So I took the deliberate decision to say, well, no, I'm, I'm only going to play the guitar inside of my donut, but my, I, I stopped my ambition and uh, I'm just going to remain an average guitar player uh, for, for the time being. Um, so it works in two directions and uh, very often people get frustrated that they don't advance anymore. But basically the honest question people have to ask themselves is, yeah, do I really want to advance? And very often people would be very happy to remain an amateur. Um, and the strange thing that happens with you at that point in time is because you then avoid deep practice, you only stay in the fun zone and the activity starts to give you energy to do deep practice in another area. Um, mm -hmm. And that's used, for example, uh, in France. Um, I work with the coach, and, and she works with uh, top athletes in um, gymnastics. And uh, I don't know if you're aware, but gymnastics together with swimming is the, the sport where you have to push, put in the most hours of training, of deep oh, practice, okay. to get a result. Um, so the problem is when you're young, you're, you're 14, 15, uh, training for the Olympics. You need to keep your energy level high. So they start, one of the first things they do when you get onto, uh, on, on, on the Olympic team is they start measuring your, your interest profile and look at, okay, what triggers you and what gives you energy, what fits into your donuts and what doesn't. And uh, the concept is called flow. And we, we, we talked mm -hmm. about, uh, I mentioned the word earlier. Um, but the more time you spend in flow, the more your battery, your energy battery um, gets filled. So the more you can also spend time outside of your donuts. So an interesting concept I also want to I use in, in coaching when I, when I work with CEOs and, 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 and senior executives is, okay, where do you tap your energy from? And very often it's a completely different field. Um, so. I also like to challenge the work-life balance ID because it's very different for, for, for every individual. Where you get your energy from is different than where I get my energy from. And the error people make is that they have no clue what drives them. Um, a very interesting test um, for, for the people uh, listening um, to this is do you know your interest profile and an interest profile i don't know if you know your interest profile. No, i did Maybe it i did it as a result of the book <laughs> yeah yeah yes, yeah yes. um yeah. it's 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 fascinating um people say i want to become passionate but they have no clue where to look for passion well you start with your interest profile the first thing you need to do is uh, what triggers your interest and uh, then you can start building using deep practice to turn your interest profile into something much more stable. But if you don't know where to start from, it's, it's very hard. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, when I was in a, in a challenging position in my career, um, somebody advised me, Jerome, you, sh you should do more gardening. And that person was explaining that, uh, yeah, gardening, it gives me so much energy and, and uh, so I tried it and it made it worse, <laughs> but I didn't know why. So yeah, this guy likes it. I, I hate it. And uh, when I look at my interest profile, I'm not a doer. Um, I'm not a practical person. So uh, it's, it's something I, I, if I want to get more energy, it's something I have to avoid, not start doing. Um, so so it's, it's crucial that you know your own interest profile if you want to 
build your own energy tank to a uh, to higher level. Right. Um, yeah, that was very powerful for me to do that because because I'm I'm not a doer either, right? Um, but I'm a I came out as artistic and uh, the, the one that concerns imagination, right? So I yeah. so I like ideas and I like creating things. Uh, so if I'm looking to so that would suggest then, according to this thesis, that I should be looking to develop deep practice in some combination of those areas. Yeah, I can imagine, for example, writing would fit very well with, uh, with what you do. And I think if, you, if I look to your, your podcasts and what you've developed, it's, it's pretty amazing. And uh, it fits very nicely with your interest profile. So I can imagine you get a lot of energy by doing that because uh, there, is a, there is a nice fit. Yeah, exactly. But one of the things I'm getting from this conversation is I, I kind of really enjoy it. And what I said, I, 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 I'm developing some facility and in interviewing people. But really, for me to become a master here, I would need to start studying other great podcasts or chunking down what specific aspects of the way that they interview people am I not doing. Um, and really, I guess, get much more analytical about where I can start to i don't want to it's not is it address weaknesses or develop new pockets of skill i mean how would i characterize that but it's it's yeah. adding these chunks of ability on right yeah it's 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 basically both the, the easiest way to to imagine that is to look at a skyscraper and maybe today you are at the level of i don't know um the, the level 34 in in this skyscraper the difficulty is that th there are no stairs and there is no elevator, but there is like a hidden um, hatch that you have to figure out where it is, and then you have to build your own stair to get there. The easiest way to do so is to figure out and find somebody who is at the level 35 in the building or 36, so somebody who uh, found the hatch and climbed through it, but isn't at level 50 or 60 because they don't remember difficulty linked to climbing the level so it's 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 so that so that's one thing um, um so it's like looking for people that do podcasts and that are a little bit better and then trying to figure out okay what are the chunks they master that i don't have tackled and how can i develop them it's similar to my storytelling uh, technique the other one is figure out what are some systematic mistakes that you have dragged with you climbing to floor 33 and 34. Um, very often, um, those are smaller things that we are not aware of, but that we, that we take with us. Um, I am, I'm a professional speaker, and um, I used to teach a course which was um, advanced um, for, for, for people that are quite good on stage, but that want to become better. And every time when you put somebody on stage, you're impressed because they're already quite good. But if you then start analyzing what they do, you will always find two or three small errors that very often people are not aware um, that they do. For example, under stress, they start to talk a little bit faster or um, one of their hands don't move in sync with the other hand, et cetera, et cetera. People very often don't notice until they're filmed, challenged. Um, and that's, that's what I would call, it. it's like a systematic error. Uh, it's not a big thing, but uh, yeah, if you continue climbing, uh, your backpack will become heavier and heavier. So you wanna get rid of them at a certain point in time in order to be successful. So um, I think that's also an interesting question to see, okay, what are now some of the, the small things that, uh, um, that I can change in order to uh, to make my backpack lighter and climb to the next level. That's great. That's, that's, a, that's a good insight. And for your own writing, have you have you discovered any systematic areas that you you've had to leave, get out of your backpack? Yeah. Well, um, for me, it was it, it was very much related to, the, for example, the way I use verbs. I'm not a native um, English speaker, so um, I have been taught English in school. And surprisingly, my verb structure was too complex. So I used too many, too many different formats uh, of, of one verb because that's how it was taught in school. And even though it was correct, it made it very difficult because you were in, 
in different time zones in one chapter. So one of the things that I had to learn was to simplify the way I had to look at verbs and become more creative in, in using words that really describe, instead of using had and have and the, the, the classical verbs, but quite boring. I had to go and look very specifically, okay, what is now the exact word that fits with what I actually want to say here? Um, and uh, so my writing wasn't wrong, but uh, it was too complex and a little bit boring. Um, and uh, yeah, I I didn't really see it. And when somebody read my text, people really didn't pick up on it. But um, I found a guy who was really good at writing and I sent him some of the stuff that I wrote. And uh, yeah, that's the feedback that, that I got from him, for example, to say, well, that's, uh, that, that's a systematic error that, uh, that you run into. Right, so what I'm he hearing here as well is that th this takes humility, right? You've got to go and knowingly subject yourself to potentially harsh criticism uh, well, well, knowing we had willingly do that. So, so what, you know, what has people to put themselves into that position? Well, um, I think it's, it goes back to your interest profile. If you really find an activity that really fits with who you are as a person, so it fits you automatically, it gives you energy. So. Um, once you start going and you get into flow, it, it's a really nice feeling. Like when I write or when I'm on stage, I really, really, really like it. So because I like the activity so much, it's not that big of an effort to challenge yourself and ask yourself the question, okay, how can I change it? The difficult part becomes in the deep practice. Yeah, because if you really want to change a certain particular activity, like I said with my guitar playing, I identified it wasn't that difficult to identify what I did wrong and how I could improve. The problem was that it would take three hours of practice a day to move to the next level. And that's something I didn't enjoy. Mm -hmm. So then I stopped. Right. Um, so it's, it's finding the, the better you fit your activity with your interest profile, um, the less energy it will consume to, uh, to do so. But uh, yeah, why isn't everybody a pathfinder, the highest level? It's exactly because at a certain point in time, the, the effort to improve requires so much energy that people um, stop doing that. Right. But the other thing that, that I, I really got from the book was, so, so I get it, you know, there'll, there'll just be a certain profile of people who are prepared to, to take on that effort and, and, and others won't. But there's also this idea of purpose, right? And, and there's a couple of studies, there's one that they do with lifeguards that you mentioned in the book and, and maybe a couple of others where this, this idea of having a purpose is so important as a differentiator in whether I take on the practice. Yeah. Yeah. I, whenever I was uh, touring with my second book, The Execution Shortcut, um, where I explain how um, you can use people dynamics to execute a strategy, I very often got the question, but what about the why question? What about purpose? Uh, because it, it wasn't really part of my book. And I found out that about 75% of the people, 75% um, of, of everyone is actively looking for purpose or, or trying to answer the why question. So it's a very important question. So I dived into it in my third book. And the first thing I've noticed is that most people have no clue what finding a purpose means. So I think we, we, we should start with that. And basically a purpose is nothing more than using your developed interest and put it to the good use of a community. And that community could be your family, it could be a friend, it could be your company, it could be the world. So it's basically a skill that you've developed to a certain level and you put it to good use for, for a group. 
And when you look at it like that, it becomes much easier to start looking for your purpose. Now, once you've answered the question, okay, what am I good at? For example, you're very good at having a, a chat with people for a longer period of time and, and keeping it interesting and, and, and interacting. Because I feel when we talk that, that you, you generally like to book and you make me comfortable talking about it. And using that skill that you probably developed a long time before you start doing this, you now put it to, to good use and you've created a community of listeners and, and viewers where you, where you do that skill. So that's the challenge we all have. Um, I'm, for example, also quite good at analyzing problems and figuring out how to solve them. Uh, well, I've put it to good use and uh, the soccer club of my son was in financial difficulty and uh, I've helped them for free for two years to get out of the debt position and to, um, to, to restructure the, the, the soccer club. It's not a big club, but it's a local community where I live. And uh, so that's the challenge we all have. It's, it's for, first of all, figuring out what we like and what we're good at, and then to good use to, um, to a community. And the mistake we often make is we don't have to save Africa or save the environment to, uh, to create a purpose. A purpose could also be uh, being a good father or, uh, or being a good coach or, um, or sharing ideas. And right. um, that's, but, that's the why question. But I like that because that's a much simpler, simpler formulation because sometimes we, that, that why could, could, well, it's at least for me, it can feel so heavy. Like, oh God, what's my purpose? Yeah. <laughs> that, feels, that feels like too noble for a Wednesday lunchtime. Right, yeah. but about that idea of like, what's what am I interested in? That's kind of fairly easy. And then how could I put this to use in my community is relatively easy. So I I, I like that formulation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. And I wonder if it's useful to share. I mean, I think there, I think it was a life class example, and then the tomato processing example of where having people reflect on that question caused an an increase in performance. Is it worth sharing one of those? So. Well, you can look for purpose from an individual level, and that's, that's what we just discussed in the last five minutes. Mm. Um, but what I have found is that if you can give people a purpose in a company perspective, performance will also go up. Um, the tricky part is that it's not always easy to identify the community that triggers people. And I've looked at... Um, examples where it's easy to find a community if you take a lifeguard it's easy people that are drowning it's easy yeah if you can save one person once a year i think you can be really proud and it can, can give you a lot of energy but then i died in imagine if you have a job where that connection to a community is not that clear how how does it work and uh, I found a, an American researcher that identified the most, well, not boring job, but the most distant job uh, that you could have, a tomato harvester. And that individual only works in a certain season. Very often they live out of a hotel. They're picked up in the morning. They don't talk with somebody. The whole day they pick tomatoes and then they go back to the hotel. And the next day they're in a different field and a different. So it's a very lonely job. and. That, that researcher tried to have interaction with customers, but they found out that the to tomato harvester couldn't care less about uh, Heinz ketchup or any other, that it didn't have any impact on, on their purpose. So then she tried something very interesting. She, she, she had workers from the factory. So that's the next step. In the, in the process. So once you, the tomatoes are harvested, somebody has to clean them and work with them. And uh, so she got a guy from the factory making a short video for the tomato harvester, basically saying, well, I'm very happy uh, that you do your job and uh, you do a great job. And the cleaner the tomato arrives in the factory, the easier my job. And they found it gave them a bump in uh, their purpose uh, and the performance of the tomato harvesters that saw a video only of a few minutes 
their performance went up, I think, with seven or eight percent just by showing because it touched their purpose. It was basically saying, hey, if I do my job a little bit better, my community, the people that work in the factory, I will make them happy. My skill of harvesting tomato actually has purpose because the better I do my job, the easier their job is and I will make that group happy. So we don't have to go too far in looking for purpose. We basically want to look for, okay, if we have a certain individual in our company, okay, how can we link the skills of that individual to a group of people that would benefit from that skill and make it visible? So I've been using that technique a lot by making small videos uh, within organizations where one group that does something with the output of another group to, to make that visible. And uh, mm. it's, it's a very easy but powerful technique to touch upon the why question in a, in a much more pragmatic way. Yeah, I also like that because I'm very familiar with that idea in organizations of, of value chain mapping and where you, 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 know, you plot out all of the areas where stuff is getting stuck and you've got waiting times and, and, and where communication isn't happening. But it's, it's a very analytical, right? And you're trying to model it all as processes. But that is a very powerful idea. What if we thought about the the purpose of one group vis-a-vis -vis the next group in the chain? I mean, that's, exactly. yeah. that's powerful. Yeah, and in the end, um, energy doesn't come from the brain, but it comes from the heart. So mm. it needs emotions. And uh, again, we end up with storytelling. So storytelling isn't only good for books, but it's also very good in, uh, in other communication areas like uh, sharing purpose. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, you share the, the story of Viktor Frankl in the book and um, the fact that it was his strong sense of purpose in the concentration camp that had him stay alive in his estimation. Yeah, it's amazing that even in the most harsh situations, um, hope is a very powerful emotion. And very often, hope and purpose are connected to each other. Because uh, purpose talks about the future and hope is linked to the future. So by having something to aspire for, by having a finish line, by having something where you want to be, um, also triggers all kinds of powerful human emotions. Very often emotions we are not directly aware of, um, but have a very strong uh, or provide a very strong engine to uh, to keep going and uh, frank frankel um, who was a psychologist found it when he was um yeah in a in a the, the most harsh he was in a concentration camp during during the army and he he basically saw that more people had identified a purpose so the hope um more chance they had to uh, to survive and uh, he applied it to himself and um he told him that, uh, yeah, one, one element was his family. So that's something that we can easily relate to. But the other one was he wanted to write a book. And uh, when he arrived, that took everything from him. And uh, he basically made it his, um, his mission to collect scraps of paper. To, um, and, and by the time he was free, he, uh, he had this book ready partly on, on scraps of paper, partly in his mind. It was published and it became one of the, the greatest books of all time. And uh, when, when, when you listen to him explaining what, what got him through the experience, he said that, well, part of that was, uh, was the hope that one day his ideas and his book and his findings would be, would be published. And uh, that kept him going, whereas other people, um, gave up um, so um, the element of how we always talk that, that being positive is crucial but there is actually scientific proof that uh, people that are positive will do much better than people that uh, that aren't um, 
yeah but and it's positive in this in this particular way that it's 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 having a positive orientation not just to the potential benefits to be of this particular activity or let's say deep practice but of the, the benefits to the wider community and and that again back to the, the lifeguards example just for whatever reason that really resonated with me that because the, the experiment was they wrote they showed videos uh, to lifeguards um describing how lifeguards had um had taken the lifeguarding skills and applied them to to their own benefit later in life so these these skills they develop as lifeguards become beneficial later down the line for people and then they show them the, another cohort of lifeguards well these these are the examples in which lifeguards are saving lives and it was the the latter group that saw the bigger performance bump because for them it was connecting them to you know how they're helping the broad broader community yeah. and, and others out there and i suppose why it resonates to me is quite often when i'm kind of trying to think positively i'll be honest quite often i'm thinking about what other benefits can i get in my life through doing this thing and sometimes i'll think what could be the benefits of this to, to, the, to the community but not always so i can see that there's a there's sort of paradox here whereas if i could orientate myself more towards what's the benefit i can provide to the community i'm likely to improve my own skills and so on and and um ultimately i could i could benefit it's this paradox right well i i don't think it's a paradox i think it's it is surprising yes um but you need both all right so there there is a selfish element if if it doesn't trigger your interest profile okay you won't even get to your community Right. Um, I always say that the, 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 the selfish part is the sprint fiber. So it will get you going to a certain level. But once you reach a certain level, and if you reach floor 34 or, or 35 as a, as, a, as a podcast expert, um, you won't have enough energy to climb to level 40. And that's when you then have to tap into your community to to move to the next level if i look at myself as a as an author in the beginning yes it was also selfish i like to write i like to develop myself but uh that's good for one book but uh to write a second book the reason why i wrote a second book is because i created a community with the first book and people said hey i really like it can you can you share more ideas and what do you think about this and what do you think about that so so in the end, that, that's how it works. And I often get this question, or, or, or let's say it differently. Very often when people think about change and transformation in a company, they think when they go on stage and they have to convince people, they have to answer the question, what's in it for me? That, or that, that's the core question people have when they're in the audience. And partly that is true. But the core question people have is, okay, what can I do here to help the team win. Mm. So most people are much less selfish than we think. Like I mentioned, 75% of the people is looking for purpose. So they want to do something good for a community. And that's something as leaders, we don't tap into enough. So if we can help people in our organizations to find that community and to help them use their skills to favorably influence that community, they will have more energy on the long term to keep going. And, uh, and it's interesting, if we would have this discussion, and I would challenge you is, yeah, just spend a few hours to think about your community and, and try to picture them and maybe look at the positive feedback you got from individuals and, uh, and, and make, them, make them life. Write them down, picture of their names, look them up on, on LinkedIn. And then the next time when you're challenging or looking, maybe you can reach out to them or you can have a dialogue or so make it human. And uh, I do it with my readers as well. I have a group of core readers. And whenever I start a new idea, I involve them. And having that community around me um, really helps me through yeah, some difficult times. It's a challenge to get up every morning at seven to start writing, especially in the beginning when uh, <laughs> you have 500 words and you know you have 40,000 to go. Um, so, so, so that really, that that really helps. Yeah, yeah. 
And maybe, well, I know that time is now uh, upon us. Uh, you've got another, you've got another call to go to. Um, and maybe that's a great place to end it. I mean, fascinating conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, the, the book is wonderful. Lots of stories. The art of, of performance. Um, very well written. I uh, thoroughly recommend it. Um, so they can find that on all good bookstores. <laughs> I got it on Amazon. Uh, where else can people go if they, if they want more of you, Jerome, or more of your thing? Well, um, I share a lot um, through my blog. Um, I, I, I post um, a longer article every Friday morning. Uh, you can access my blog on my personal website. Um, so that might be a, an other good area to uh, to get some some videos, some information if people are interested in improving their performance or improving the performance of their organization. And uh, and what's the link for that? It's uh, gironedeflander.com. Okay, great. Uh, all right. Well, thank you once again. It's been fascinating. Wonderful I enjoyed it. Thank you again. All right. <laughs> Thank you. See you. Bye -bye. Have a good day. Bye.